Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Ali Sanjabi, Andrew Bradley, and Dale Mulcahy. Coming up on DTNS, Meta cuts hardware, including a watch that had cameras. Apple is becoming a finance company, and Microsoft takes the early lead in game streaming. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 9th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Reddit, I'm Sarah Lane. Deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my friends, do we have some conversations for you? Is game streaming even a thing that people care about? We're going to fight. We're not going to fight, but we're going to talk about that. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. TikTok is adding new features to limit your time in the app, including a reminder tool telling you you've been using it for whatever period of time you yourself define as enough time. TikTok is also adding a new safeguard to existing daily limits. Users between the ages of 13 and 17 will be prompted to use the screen time limited tool if they spend over 100 minutes in the app in any given day. And the app is also adding a new screen time dashboard that shows a summary of app usage statistics. Yeah, because the ads don't work that far in anyway. The Vivaldi browsers have added a free built-in email client in beta testing since last year. This joins the browser's integrated calendar and feed reader. All three can be viewed from a sidebar while browsing. Go give it a try. The Vivaldi browser. I was using it today. I'm a big fan. Dell redesigned its XPS 13 lineup. The XPS 13 laptop uses 9-watt 12th gen Intel processors. A 1.8x smaller motherboard uses a single cooling fan, boasts a 12-hour battery life, and ditches a headphone jack but includes a USB-C to headphone adapter. It's available now starting at $1,000. We also have the XPS 13 2-in-1. It now comes with a detachable display with an XPS Folio keyboard sold separately, optional integrated 5G, and weighs 1.6 pounds without the keyboard. Comes out this summer, but we don't have pricing on that one yet. Microsoft continued its pro worker campaign Wednesday, announcing it will no longer include non-compete clauses in U.S. employment agreements, and it will remove them from existing agreements. Microsoft will also no longer include non-disclosure agreements that would prevent employees from revealing allegations of misconduct. It will publish findings from a third-party civil rights audit and, in compliance with Washington law on this last one, publicly disclosed salary ranges for U.S. jobs starting in January 2023. Bell can announce the sound form at nano wireless earbuds for kids designed for children seven and up. It keeps volume below 85 decibels. The buds are also IPX5 rated for water resistance, offer five hours of battery on a charge and come with ear tips for extra small ears. Oh. Little options for, for the smaller ears. Yeah, they go on sale at the end of June for $50. I'm, I'm going to keep a pair on me on flights just in case. <laughs> just a handout to hand it to a child who is watching his iPad without earbuds for youth. Uh, all right, enterprise products where decent consumer tech goes to die when the consumer world doesn't love it anymore. Uh, Google Glass, Magic Leap, get ready to welcome the Facebook portal. The information sources say that Meta is going to try selling the portal to businesses now instead of consumers as a device meant to help keep employees connected in a hybrid working environment. Uh, Meta also, according to this information article, uh, launching uh, AR headsets a couple of years down the road. The, the new roadmap is going to postpone the launch of augmented reality headsets by a few years. All of this is supposedly cost-cutting. Executives said in April that Meta will reduce expenses by $3 billion this year, and the information says these are part of the way they're going to cut those costs. Cost-cutting may also have played a part in shelving another project as well. So I think there's a few things here that you should pay attention to. Number one, the portal moving to enterprise, like Tom mentioned, is indeed the graveyard of where projects and verticals can now pretend like they have some kind of use. If you can sell fleets of them to various different companies, I think that is a white flag on the idea that Amazon has a reputation and utility for being able to be in your home and listen to you at all times. Facebook, which already has privacy concerns, does not. Uh, as for the AR, I think that's the bigger story, because quite frankly, I don't think that this is reshuffling around to to avoid whatever Apple's going to put out. I just think that the tech isn't there. And what I would cite as evidence is show me an AR device that's even close to what we would expect an AR device to be right now. I mean, the HoloLens is the closest at this point, right? And even that, well, and that's, that's going well. well. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, it's there. It's a few thousand dollars, but um, we, sh- we should probably tell them the one other cost cutting measure that that apparently Facebook is taking as well before we, we move on a little bit. Indeed. Bloomberg sources say Meta has halted work on a smartwatch code named Milan that had dual cameras. One five megapixel camera was below the display and the second 12 megapixel camera sat on the back side of the wrist. The second one was supposed to be used as removing the watch from the strap so you could use the watch face as a viewfinder for a picture. However, Meta has talked about using something called electromyography to translate server signals into hand gestures that can be interpreted for gesture control. The second camera on the watch reportedly interfered with those sensors. Those kind of sensors could be used to control virtual avatars and interact with objects in augmented reality, something that is more of a priority for the newly renamed Meta. Supposedly, Meta is now working on other wrist-worn devices. Well, and I think that brings us back to that augmented reality situation where they may be saying we need to focus on how people are going to behave in this thing before we push out something. Because before, if you remember, we, we talked not that long ago on the show about their roadmap saying like, oh, we'll come out with this one uh, glasses that'll do a little bit of stuff and then we'll expand it and it'll do a little bit more stuff. Uh, and, and I think maybe Meta's making a somewhat smart decision to say, let's come up with a good control device and wait for the environment to be there before we push out a headset that nobody's going to buy. Here's here's the biggest problem with AR right now. It's your field of view. Uh, and that was the problem with HoloLens. That's been the problem with everything that's come out is that, you know, for virtual reality, it did not get good until you were effectively, no matter where you looked uh, out of the side of your eye, you would never see a border. And we're not nearly there yet with AR. And I don't think that we're even at the starting line until we get there. Yeah, and Apple is probably going to come out with their first product in in, uh, in January. Earlier this week, the word was like, ah, that's going to let Meta beat them to the punch. But now the information is saying, well, they're going to come out with new Oculus headsets, VR headsets, but they aren't going to come out with AR headsets, which then kicks it to Apple to be the one to make the case. Ah, this is why you want it. This is why you waited, but also puts them in the rather unusual position of being first to market with something. They very rarely are. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this feels like uh, we've got you know, uh, you know, the four or five companies who all say we're 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 trying to be the leader here, but we're none of us are quite ready for this yet. Apple is uh, the most silent of all the companies on all of this, but yeah, if you're if you're Facebook and you've got some hardware stuff in the pipeline and you're sort of wondering what the industry standard is going to be, might be you, might be another company company like Apple might be somebody else. I feel like we're, and as a VR enthusiast, very much so, you know, I'm still kind of like AR. Okay. I mean, how do I use it day to day? You know, if I'm playing a game or something on a mobile device, fine. But how does this actually become part of my life? And we're just not there yet. We're, yeah. It feels like we're, we're close to being there, but we're not there. I don't think the display technology is good enough as Justin was making that point very well. And I don't think the use case is clear. You know, there, there's a lot of right. good stuff yeah. being done around like, oh, this can be your workspace monitor because your screens can be as big as you want. And that's interesting, but it's also not as mobile uh, as, as even though it's on your, your, your head, it's like you have to put it on. And then when you take it off, you're not going to see your screens anymore. So it's, it's not permanent. Um, Maybe it's too mobile <laughs> is the way to put there's it. There's also a, a real fit uh, uh, issue with this in terms of weight. Because unlike VR, AR is making the argument that you should be wearing this more. You're not going to a destination. You are. Yeah, it's it's life. real world stuff. You're not, yeah, exactly. you know, hanging out in your garage, you know, playing a VR game like it, I do. It's the reason why that initial Google Glass demo video is one of the greatest promises of vaporware ever because like that use case is what got people excited about modern ar right like in 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 a real world device was give me directions allow me to see my text messages as they come in let me look at the weather real quick uh uh, while i'm while i'm on uh walking around this busy new york city street we're not close to any of that oh so many years down the road 
Meanwhile, uh, the, the big news here is, is Meta getting rid of this watch, which like who was going to object to a company that runs Facebook putting two cameras on your wrist? Uh, that sounds like a great idea. I great mean, and even if it wasn't Meta, the, you know, the, the whole idea of, you know, uh, what, one of the things that my Apple Watch doesn't have is, I mean, I can look at photos, but I'm not taking taking pictures, but it's also... Well, you're supposed to be able to pick it up, up off the band easily I and get then that. use it. I... Yeah, and you know, that's the way you lose things. It just, <laughs> it, it feels clunky to me. feels clunky. Yeah, I, I think the bigger story here too is Meta's retrenching. Meta is saying we're not going to waste money anymore, and and that's that's mm-hmm. part of a wider trend that's going on in this economy, of course. But but it's also uh, Meta trying to decide where they really need to spend their money, uh, and apparently it's on taking more time to develop AR and not consumer devices like the portal, like the watch. Well. One company that has decided they know where the money is, and I think they might be right, is Apple, revealing more details about its Apple Pay Later feature, which is coming to iOS 16. Let's explain a little more about that first. Yeah, so if you missed it, Pay Later is a buy now, pay later, or BPNL, uh, B- BNPL rather, service for short, letting you split your purchase up into four payments, interest-free. So BNPL big business with companies like Klarna or Afterpay getting a lot of attention. Many of you might use one or both. They make their money by getting a cut from the retailers that they work with. The idea being is they bring in more business by handling the short-term loans. Then they can also make money off of late fees and interest, usually interest charged on late payments, that sort of thing. Much of that is, is, is pretty cut and dry, but what is new here? Yeah, so Apple's creating a wholly owned subsidiary that's called Apple Financing LLC to handle Apple Pay later. Now, that brings it a little more in-house than Apple Card. Apple Card is largely operated by Goldman Sachs, but Apple Pay later will still have large chunks operated by external vendors. So when you see headlines saying Apple brings everything in-house, not everything, MasterCard's white label product called Installments is still going to handle the payments to the merchants. So MasterCard's handling the merchant uh, retail uh, relationship. Merchants won't have to do anything on their end uh, for Apple Pay later to work. Uh, It's just the way that the payments are delivered to the merchants. And Apple isn't a bank yet. Yet. So it will rely on Goldman Sachs to be the technical issuer of the loan. And Goldman Sachs is going to handle some of the payment processing as well. Although Apple's apparently working on that end is, uh, to bring it in house as well. But what they're bringing in house right now is credit checks and approving the loans themselves. Apple's going to run what's called a soft credit check. This is when they just look for limited information to make sure, okay, does this this person have the capability of paying back a loan uh, instead of doing the full credit report like you would if you got a mortgage or something like that. And it's capping the loans. Sounds like the loans will be capped at $1,000. So you wouldn't be able to use Apple Pay Later on on a MacBook, uh, anything larger <laughs> or than an iPhone. <laughs> yeah, or, or most yeah. of the iPhones. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if payments are missed, and remember, uh, Buy Now, Pay Later is usually installment payments payments within a month. You might you've, you might pay weekly, you might pay every a couple of weeks. It's not a monthly payoff. It's just delaying the payments. So sometimes people don't make that last payment. If those payments are missed, no further Apple Pay Later purchases will be approved, but Apple says it will not report missed payments to credit bureaus. So if you use Apple Pay Later, it would not affect your credit score. I don't know why Anybody who has followed this company for any significant length of time would be shocked that Apple wants to bring more and more of their processes in-house. That is their MO. It is their corporate uh, uh, structure. It is their ethos. Uh, they are the scorpion and the frog. Why do they do it? Because it is their nature. They, 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 they know no other way than to perfect things internally. That being said, it shows that Apple is very much more a services company than they have ever been before. And one of the big things that people think of when they think of services is the money service. Yeah. I mean, you can't operate services without bringing in money. And if you're operating the part that brings in the money, the payment processing, the loaning, all of that, uh, you're making more money. It all. It also just makes it a lot more attractive to someone saying, ooh, I really want this new iPhone, say, 
But you know, I, I don't have $1,300 in my pocket, but oh, for payments, interest-free, this all sounds pretty nice. Now, of course, as, as anybody who's familiar with credit knows, it can get away from you, and this would be no different. Um, so it's not like Apple saying, hey, we're not like other credit card companies. <laughs> we're just going to, well, you and, know, and you let used you iPhone, the which, which really isn't the best example. This is, I'm in the store and I'm buying clothes. Yes. I can use Apple Pay later to yes, stock up on exactly. extra clothing that I wouldn't have bought otherwise. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, this is this is not just like, oh, what I'm buying in the Apple store. This is what I'm buying, period. The product they are trying to replace is money. Like you've seen that in their ads where the guy is in line to buy a, 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 a candy bar and he doesn't have cash on him. So he applies yep. the Apple card in line and then gets the candy bar because it's that fast. They're replacing a lengthy process with a less lengthy process. Now they are taking a very big painful issue. Oh no, my card is not uh, 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 accepted, but I really want to get this, I don't know, present for my child. I'm just writing an Apple commercial now. Now they are able to do it along with this feature. Apple is literally money. Yeah. I. Remember on Buzz Out Loud at CNET when Mollywood and I covered Apple acquiring PA Semi, the designer of chips, and, and the mind boggled. Why would they want a designer of chips? Well, we now know that was a very smart move that started a cascade of events that led to the M1 chips. Uh, this might be the equivalent in finance. Yeah. Hey, folks, if you're thinking of adding solar panels to your home, uh, you've got to listen to our solar panel roundtable. Uh, myself, Sarah, and three guests explain the process, things to consider, what you can expect to spend, what you can expect to save, uh, whether you're going to DIY it or hire someone to do it for you. It's coming into our feed this Saturday, so be sure to listen to it Saturday. And if you're like, no, I want to listen to it now, well, become a patron because Patreons already have access to it at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right. Microsoft previously said it's moving away from making a game streaming device and towards putting apps on multiple platforms. We've talked about it on the show. And we have the first version of this. The Xbox app is launching on June 30th on Samsung's 2022 smart TVs with plans to expand to other models and other manufacturers. It gives users access to their Game Pass Ultimate account. Xbox on Samsung TVs will work by Bluetooth with Xbox Wireless, Xbox Adaptive, Elite Series 2, and Sony DualSense controllers. So you got some options there. The Xbox app will be available in the Samsung Gaming Hub. You can also log in to access uh, an existing subscription if you have one or sign up for a new one from within the app as well. So, Tom, for those of us who need a little bit of a reminder, remind us what Game Pass gets you. Yeah, if you're you're unfamiliar, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate has more than 100 games available to stream for $15 a month. There's a few other things here, but for the purposes of this story, that's the important part. Uh, there are cheaper versions that are limited to either your PC or your Xbox itself, but Ultimate gives you access across platforms, and that now includes Samsung 2022 TVs. Uh, you don't have to pay anything to play Fortnite through Xbox Game Pass app. Uh, you can just log in with a Microsoft account and be able to play Fortnite for free. That's the biggest of the Microsoft Xbox-related announcements, but Microsoft made some other announcements today too. Indeed, they did. Microsoft also announced that later this year, all Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will get the ability to stream some games that they have purchased outside the Game Pass Ultimate library. The company mm -hmm. announced that within the next year, Project Moorcroft will get to submit demos of their games and get paid for them. Microsoft didn't detail how those payments would work, just said that they would work <laughs> somehow. Xbox Cloud Gaming Beta also launched in Argentina and New Zealand. Okay, but let's get back to playing Xbox games on a TV. If I, it's something I want to do, and that sounds pretty good because, you know, I got a TV already. How does it work? Yeah, it's um, better than I would have thought, according to The Verge's Cameron Faulkner. Uh, Cameron Faulkner wrote up a great uh, rundown of trying this out on a Samsung TV in a hotel over Wi-Fi. Uh, and, and Faulkner points out, like, you probably want to wire this thing up if you're doing it yourself. But I was using it over hotel Wi-Fi, and... It worked. It was a little smoother than Android. Faulkner wrote, minor instances of hitching and some noticeable compression aside, it was a perfectly serviceable, 
yet inherently imperfect experience. It's never going to be a one-to-one -one parallel to experiencing the latest games directly from a console that can render native 4K or close to it. But in the absence of a console, I'd be smitten to use this TV app instead of loading games up on a tablet or phone. Uh, and then continued to say, what I'm getting at is that this app feels like it should be good enough to serve as the sole avenue for gaming for a lot of people. I think I this is compelling because of that. Because not just is it easy access for people like, oh, it's already on my TV. And, and yeah, right now it's on a limited number of Samsung TVs, but the idea is eventually it's going to be on a bunch more. But it's also the second game console for the kids to play while you're on the real console. Is it? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I feel like this is this. I, I liken this to, OK, if I'm if I'm watching a if I'm streaming a movie and, you know, it's hiccuping and, you know, and buffering, it's like, OK, this is unwatchable. But if it's it's kind of not the 4K experience that I thought it would be, but still pretty good, I'm still going to watch it. That's uh, that's how I feel like a lot of people will be able to use something like this, you know, out and about. Will they? I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, the they will if they're desperate this enough. Is, yeah. The problem with game streaming, though, you have two very divergent, very different communities that both fall under the umbrella of gaming. You've got very, very casual mobile players that want to play their cookie collectors or me with Hearthstone that are, are playing in this realm. And, and, and we are legion where there's there's a gigantic, infinite amount, uh, amount of us. Then there are PC and console uh, people. Please hold your tomatoes. I'm going to put you all in one bucket for two seconds. Just try to get along for the boat for try the purposes of this allegory. Five seconds uh, uh, or I will turn this metaphor right around. Uh, <laughs> There are people that want to pay a lot of money. They want to get very invested. They have a larger budget. And for that, they want the best experience. I, and, and what game streaming seems to me is a bridge technology that could either bring along people from a more casual community or be the methadone to the heroine of the, the harder core community. And I think it is more likely to be the latter. There's more likely to be people who already have Xbox game pass that are like, eh, whatever I'm, I'm on the road. I'll, I'll play this uh, on a hotel Wi-Fi. Then there is from, from the casual group. I, I still don't know whether or not this is the future and the way that people talk about it being the future. Cause to me, Seems like the mushy middle. I disagree. I think this is the silent majority that want this. There are an overrepresentation of people uh, who say they want no lag and the best, you know, resolution. And lots of them mean it. I'm, I'm not trying to say they don't. But there's a lot of people who say it and then will put up with something else, or say it and don't actually buy the equipment they need to get it, uh, mm -hmm. and will take the convenience, right? The the compromise of convenience to be like, well, I could try to buy that thing and install it, or I could just use the app that's on here and it's pretty close to as good. Uh, and that's where the genius comes in. If Microsoft, like Netflix in the early days, is everywhere. It's on all the platforms. It's on Roku. It's on LG TVs. It's on Sony TVs. It's already on iPhones, Android, uh, tablets, and you're like, oh, I can just have this account and play whatever game I want. It can be limited. It can be casual. It can be more, more advanced. I can use whatever controller. I can use a Sony controller. I can use a Microsoft controller. And instead of the mushy middle, it's the easy choice, right? It's the uh, convenience trumps fidelity argument that I'm making. Mm. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we were talking about AR and, and what is it good for earlier in the show? Amazon has launched a virtual try-on for shoes feature in its mobile app, iOS app, that helps you visualize footwear that you might buy and you might think would look good on your feet. From the product page, you point your phone's camera towards your feet and then you get a sense of how the shoes would realistically look if you're shoe gazing. <laughs> you have the option to switch colors inside the AR mode. You can share some images with friends. If I was like, hey, Tom, hey, Justin, do you like these shoes? iOS only, as I mentioned, although Amazon says the Android is coming soon in the U.S. and Canada. Initial brands, pretty fitness focused. You got Adidas, Asics, Lacoste, New Balance, Puma, Reebok, Saucony, Superga. No Nike, though. And no mm. Brooks. Tom, I know mm. you like your Brooks. Brooks is what um, I wear. But but, you know, you got some brands, at least at the beginning. Also worth noting, this won't give you information about how well a shoe is going to fit you. 
Yeah. That's something else entirely. This is just how would it aesthetically look if you were to wear them? I, I've been buying Skechers since they rebranded as a uh, shoe for old people with back problems. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And do you care what they look like or the, just that they are, help your back? No, they look fine. And they were the shoes that I bought as yeah. a child. It was a I, very effective marketing pivot for them. I, I imagine that everybody in our, in, in our, in within earshot of this podcast is like, I don't care what they look like. I want to know if they fit. I want to know if, if they, you know, if they work. I on think, my feet. I think why not both? Yeah. I, no, I, you know, sick. like, I, mean, I, I want shoes that are comfortable. I'm like, I, I am well past the era of wearing, you know, shoes that make me hate myself, but I also would like them to look as nice as possible. And some yeah. shoes just are more flattering than others or just and fit your body better. This is going to get you halfway there. I'll tell you if they look good on your, on your feet. Right. Yeah. 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 As you ram your toes on the front because they're too small. I, I will say, though, that Amazon has long ago kind of given their best solution for the fitting problem with their like free returns. And they. Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I yeah. Stuff. And, and we've talked before in the show about technology that will be able to, you know, em estimate your fit. And, and I wouldn't be mm -hmm. shocked if Amazon adds that to this down the line if this takes off or just replaces it entirely. We, with something. To be honest, I would almost rather go with an AI based on my past purchases of other clothing than. than yeah, uh, I actually want the AI to tell me what looks good, too. Yeah, I'm with you there. <laughs> You should you should just have Dolly the uh, the open <laughs> thing. Uh, <laughs> Machine learning dressing. Yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. All right, this one comes from Tynas in Cape Town, who says, "As the saying goes, the devil is de in the details." Something that has become clear following Monday's WWDC keynote iPad OS finally has a differentiator between the Pro class and the non Pro class devices in iPad OS 16. The M1 chip power devices get the new stage manager feature, but the non-pro class doesn't. Is the cheaper iPad the iPod Touch of the future? Well, okay, Dennis. Uh, like, like, yes, the cheaper iPad is always the iPod Touch of the future because they they always retire the cheapest iPads for the newer <laughs> iPads. Are, are, uh, aren't we all the iPod Touch? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but good news, it's not just pros. It's M1 chips, and there is an M1 chip in a non-pro. Uh, Apple announced Stage Manager Monday. If you don't know, it's a multitasking interface. And uh, Apple noted, as, as Dennis pointed out, that that uh, it was only going to be available on iPads with an M1 processor, which means the iPad Pro 21.9 inch fifth gen, the iPod Pro 11 inch third gen, and the fifth gen iPod a iPad Air. Why are they doing this? Apple says it's because Stage Man re Manager requires the fast memory swap feature that is only available on the M1. It uses storage for RAM in a more efficient way than you could use on an Intel chip. Uh, and they say Stage Manager uses a crap load of RAM. Uh, so they they have enough RAM on a desktop to be able to do it on Intel, but maybe not enough on the iPad. Although we'll see, maybe they'll limit it uh, uh, to, uh, to M1 Max as well. But they're saying when you have eight programs running at once on an iPad, the A series chips can't handle it. The M1 can because of the memory swap feature. So at least they tried to explain a technical reason why they're doing this. Um, well, thank you for the uh, the uh, explanation, Tom. And thanks to everybody who emails us feedback. Sometimes it's a question, sometimes it's a thought, sometimes it's an idea. We want them all. Send them our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, where can people keep up with all that you do? Why are you not able to text 911 and send them a picture, maybe a video of something that's happening? What if I told you that the government approved the plans for this over a decade ago? And yet, for whatever reason, states have drugged their feet. That and much more discussed, including Taylor Lorenz and uh, 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 Chesa Boudin being recalled from San Francisco on the latest we're Not Wrong, featuring myself, Jen Briney of The Congressional Dish, and Andrew Heaton of The Political Orphanage. The best and cold open in so podcasting long. this week was on that episode. <laughs> yes, it was it was a colorful one. Yeah, if you are if you are a family friendly <laughs> listener, then then understand that the cold open goes 
go some places, some places on Richard Gear that you may not uh, want your kids to listen to. For, for people who don't know what a cold open is, it's the first thing that you hear when you play this particular very, podcast. Very, episode. very beginning before the theme song or saying what show it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we also have a couple new bosses to thank. Larry and Skip just started backing us on Patreon. Thank Larry you, Larry. Skip. Thank you, Skip. Larry and Skip. Larry and I don't Skip know if you all know favorites. each other, but yeah, yeah I mean, you, it sounds like you're like a great duo already. That's right. A <laughs> uh, reminder, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet rolls right in after we finish here on DTNS, and it's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. A reminder, we are live. If you can join us live, we'd love to have you. Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tomorrow's Friday, and we'll be back doing it all again with Len Peralta and David Spark to talk to us about RSA, what it all means. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>